Yes. <laughs> that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Have a seat. All right. um, hello, everyone. Is everyone awake? <clears throat> Is everyone awake? There we go. Um, we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion on my favorite topic, which is innovation in Europe. Uh, my name is Robin Walters. I'm the European uh, editor of Tech.eu, uh, which is a company we started five years ago to talk about that very topic, innovation to startups in Europe. <laughs> and we we're going to be joined by a very interesting mix of people, and we'd like to welcome uh, all of them on stage now. Bindi, Adeo, and Yeva, please join us. Should we do well, boy, girl, boy, that way? All right, welcome, guys. Um, every panel starts with a little bit of an introduction, so we're going to do the same. Please keep it brief, but who are you? Bindi Korea. Oh, there we go. Speaker's working. <laughs> um, I'm from the UK, and by way of background, I'm ex-Microsoft Ventures, ex-Silicon Valley Bank, both in London. And now I'm an advisor to a combination of startups, uh, VC, uh, corporate innovation execs. And for this panel, I have been on the uh, advisory board of Startup Europe in Brussels and also the European Innovation Council advising Commissioner Moedas on um, that, pro that project. Great. So many hats. Yeva. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Eva Joves. I'm from Latvia, but I'm currently living in Silicon Valley for about already two years. So I closely monitor how things are moving and going ahead in Silicon Valley. I'm actually a government person. I have worked all my life on government side. The last part was being dealt with cybersecurity and strategic communications. I'm currently on maternity leave. I have small children for what all my American friends envy me that we have such a socially graceful system. And uh, I'm happy to be here and contribute my view from having my government experience, having EU experience, having cybersecurity experience, and at the same time looking at digital developments in Silicon Valley. Very brief, you were just on stage, but for the people who might have entered the room in the meantime. Well, uh, nothing has changed. Walt <laughs> Dombrowski is uh, uh, Vice President of the European Commission. <laughs> Still. <laughs> no. Adeo. Uh, you may remember me from the heartfelt passion talk a few minutes ago. Uh, my name's Adeo. My day job, I help start companies in around 200 cities around in, uh, all over the world, including approximately 40 cities in Europe. We are a accelerator incubator that works with idea stage companies to really inspire them to make the world better. Well, TechEU as a company has been tracking uh, this European innovation for, for a number of years. Um, I think we can all agree that we can build really good companies in Europe. Uh, we already have. Um, mm -hmm. We look at the numbers and they're going up and to the right. The total investment volume, the M&A transactions, the IPOs are all going up. But if you look at the big picture, the global picture, then we're still very much behind in numbers, especially with US and China. Um, so Ade, I want to get your take on this because you uh, invest all over the world. So what, when you think of Europe, what comes to mind? Uh, talent, uh, for, for sure, uh, hindered by bad policy. Uh, so if you look, look around the world today, um, the United States is obviously very strong. Canada is a rising star in the world of entrepreneurship and new tech innovation. Asia's just across Asia is killing it. All the markets are growing and, and China's coming in and doing M&A. And then you see Europe and, and to your point, the numbers are looking good, but the number, you know, the relative growth to the rest of the world is, is not, the rest of the world's on a hockey stick and, and Europe seems to be on a kind of more steady and stable growth rate. And, and I think I call it startup welfare. There's a lot of startup welfare in Europe and it doesn't really help companies, right? There, there needs to be a balance between something being too easy or too hard. And, and sometimes in Europe, like some things are way too hard like labor and some things are way too easy like government grants. And that, that just creates the, the wrong environment for things to blossom. 
Out of welfare, I like that term. And it also calls for a politician's response to that. So, involved. Uh, well, uh, actually, I addressed some of those points uh, already during my um, uh, introductory uh, speech. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the problem uh, which uh, we see is indeed maybe not so much in a startups uh, phase, because if you look at the startups, the number of startups uh, emerging in Europe is more or less on par with the uh, US. But uh, it's more a problem of those startups to scale up. And many of them uh, really then start in Europe. And when they need to start up, they go to US, they go to uh, Asia, elsewhere. And uh, so uh, as Europe, of course, we are losing with this lots of uh, opportunities. So we really need to look at what are the factorings of, uh, factors of uh, 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 hindering scaling up. And uh, to us, uh, two factors which uh, uh, emerge is uh, the uh, still uh, uh, barriers within the EU single market, which we still need to uh, address. We really need to have a single market of 500 consumers, then we are on par and even uh, ahead of US and um, you know, European companies then uh, can compete from uh, Europe. And a second is still uh, access to uh, capital, even though it must be said that there we see lots of the dynamism and situ situation gradually improving. Indy. I think I'll come at it slightly differently. So um, I saw just before Christmas this graph of the top 20 valued internet companies globally, and they were all American or Chinese, and not one single European company was in there. And we're kind of looking at it in a couple of different ways. So I was in Silicon Valley last November at a big event, and um, uh, there was one Chinese artificial intelligence specialist that was speaking, and he said it just succinctly. He said, the Chinese are gladiators. There's going to be one winner in one segment, and if you look at Alibaba and any of the Tencent, any of the big ones, they are gladiators and they're their winners. The Americans, they're the innovators. They see a problem, they smash the barrier, and they solve it. And the Europeans are neither of those. It's a lot of cultural thing. Then the second thing we really discussed was around venture. And the way VCs tend to work in Europe, and I know I'm generalizing, is they tend to back companies that have traction. They've got product market fit. They don't back them because they're a gladiator, or they don't back them because it's on a slide deck or on a, on a, on a napkin, like the American VCs will. So the European VCs in general tend to be a bit more conservative. So if you're backing more conservatively, the founders tend to be more conservative and you have to have traction. So I think we've really got to look about how we back it earlier and we have to have a different attitude towards success, which I don't think that we do. I have a question for you. You live in Silicon Valley. Is Latvia on the map over there? Do people know where it is? Uh, people do know where Latvia is and there are... Um, uh, very various reasons for that, including tech. But uh, if you would allow, Robin, I would actually want to follow on that first question because I want to challenge a little bit of all what has been said and not because I have a sort of magic answer of how to scale and become next Apple, Facebook, Twitter, or you name it. But what I wanted to say from my point of view, being two years in Silicon Valley and following closely what's going on. I'm going to say is that exactly like you said, there is China, there is US, and then there is Europe. And I came to conclusion that Europe is the best place to build digital future. And I'll tell you what, why. I see the irresponsibility in the United States, the beauty that there is no regulation has its advantage. I agree, you can really scale. But I think they have come to the point that they understand that that's not going to work for long. Because we are all in that. And it is a great opportunity to grow big and to scale and create a business, which is absolutely necessary. But right now, it's a really huge debate. What is that societal impact? And it's funny to see that a year ago, people who were yelling and who were criticizing and saying that there's nothing there is a, the least that one can do is invite government and to be part of, a, sort of digital, building digital future because all they do is they ruin the things and they make, they make it more complicated. Then now, I mean, you can go every other day in New York Times, Washington Post, I mean the same on Europe side, 
And you can read all the articles saying GDPR is a good step. Let's see if Europe can come up with some other ideas. What do we do with the, all the challenges that follow? And here I'm not, I, I don't want to disencourage and I don't want to say that uh, Silicon Valley is wrong or it's not a good start. I think it has changed the world dramatically and we can all, I mean, we are all on iPhones, you know, we are on Facebooks, we are, we are users of those products and they have created a great impact. But right now there is a, a lot of people are looking at Europe and asking how do we bring in that societal responsibility? How do we think about what are the impacts on people? be it social media, be it disruptive business models, because there are huge impacts. And I see the growth of sort of societal disturbance and people reacting also in US. So I see a Europe as a big player in future. I think it has all preconditions there, talent, money. I agree, we have to deal with regulations, also that are there and fragmented market. But I think we have a really right approach to go for a business and also think about people. Uh, let me just, I agree. <laughs> Facebook, Google, Amazon are evil. They are cancer <laughs> on society and they should go away. And the, the world will be a better place. And they were born in Silicon Valley and they're spreading evil throughout the world. Period, end of story. So I 100% agree that if Europe can have a core to make the world better with ideas that matter, great. You know, we talked about purpose earlier. Follow your heart, make the world better. Don't make something that turns kids into addicts to their smartphone with vanity metrics or like captures the talent of the world and puts it in a, in a cage doing nothing that matters or like sells a bunch of shit from China for, uh, you know, God knows what purpose in boxes and, and crazy, you know, I, I order something on Amazon, I get like five boxes for one order. It's just, there's a lot of, yeah, so if you can, I, I agree wholeheartedly, like we need to use our skills as human beings to make the world better, not worse. Vanity metrics don't make the world better. Uh, putting talent away in boxes don't make the world better. Shipping cheap products from China so that you can, feel better about yourself because you're deeply broken inside isn't going to make the world better. So I hope somewhere in this room today there's someone with a heart that's going to make the world better. Thank you, Adeo, for that contribution. Lindy, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I, maybe I can talk to the work that I've done um, alongside Commissioner Moedas. And those of you that don't know, he is the current innovation minister at the EU. He set up a group of um, high-level advisors, of which I was one, uh, where they set up the European Innovation Council. And really what that EIC has meant to address is actually to address a lot of these issues, to bring the next generation of scale-up and start-up. And actually, in a way for the government to provide funding to startups via the EIC, um, and then get out of the way. And that's a lot of what we did as private um, citizens, is we really advised the commissioner about the kind of funding that should go to the startups, where they should influence certain policies. Um, and they actually, to their credit, were really, really receptive. So to give you an idea, come find me throughout the day, but the EIC instrument, uh, they're deploying uh, 250K to 2 million euros uh, per startup that applies and gets through. But to give you an idea of the level of funding that's coming out, from 2018 to 2020, 2 billion euros is being deployed to a lot of these startups. And then they've put in a bid for 2021 to 27 for 10 billion euros capital to be deployed again to these early stage startups. So they're really trying to you know, fund the earlier stage innovation that quite often VCs just don't have the it's, capability clear, to it. it's clear that Europeans care. So let's go down the line. Do you care to make the world a better place, Rob? <laughs> yes, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> Clearly, I'm challenged whether to do it in US or in Europe. Or in but countries. yes. <laughs> All right. I don't think that people feel that way in Silicon Valley. Where? In Silicon Valley, people don't feel that way. So you guys, like, you know, 
Maybe we turn this into a brainstorming session, how we can get private citizens and politicians to help people out there to make the world a better place. Like, what was the first thing you would do? What would you do, Robin? Good question. I don't know. Ask questions on stage to people smarter than myself. Um, I, I would personally, I would personally start uh, looking at, uh, I've been on a bit of a, uh, a mission on this one, but sort of looking at how these big corporates can have chief ethics officers who are independent and are able to challenge the CEO, particularly of the GAFABATs of the wow. world. Do you trust them to self-regulate themselves? Well, th the point is it's a very special kind of person that would be the chief ethics officer. In the UK, for example, we do have a chief cybersecurity you know, um, convoy. There needs to be an ethics one. Right, and I think Beautiful. the MPs and politicians need to learn how to listen to the private citizens and then, you know, go from there. Uh, well, yes, actually, I was expecting more to talk on things like, I don't know, funding escalators and things like that, but we suddenly ventured in much uh, broader uh, topics. Uh, but uh, I would like uh, uh, to come back to uh, what some uh, colleagues uh, already uh, uh, said on this uh, European uh, economic uh, model of uh, social market economy. And I think this is something which we need uh, to preserve and we need to adjust to the uh, changing reality. And that's what we are also doing on the European Commission. We look, okay, economy is uh, changing. Economy is getting more uh, digital. There is... Uh, platform economy or sharing economy and gig economy and whatever. Uh, but at the same time, people who work on those economies and increasingly people work in those economies still need to be able to contribute and to acquire social rights because that's what is going to be then uh, also to ensure that people feel stable themselves and ensure stability in a broader uh, society. So one thing which we need to do is adjust our European social market uh, economy model to the changing economy and we are now uh, starting uh, to work on this just uh, uh, earlier this once for example European social partners employers and employees uh, agreed on their next multi-annual work program and actually they set uh, digitalization as a first priority because that's what they also need to address as uh, social partners, we can venture in uh, another area which is uh, sustainable finance. What we uh, came uh, forward from the Commission last uh, spring was an action plan of sustainable finance, so how we can make private capital actually to contribute to the uh, fight against uh, climate change because uh, uh, investment challenge there is immense. We need something like uh, 180 billion euros per year of additional investment to meet our Paris goals, uh, climate change goals, and it means that we need to find uh, uh, also a way to put private capital for those uh, uh, purposes. I will not go now in details. We put forward uh, several legislative propo proposals, so it's, uh, uh, it's actually progressing quite well, and you really see that it's kind of getting into mainstream, the sustainable or green uh, finance. So just to give a few examples. Uh, On the policy side, though, 25 to 50% of the human population will be out of work in 15 years. So what is the EU doing about that? Not much. And like, that's gonna happen in the US as well. And I don't think any government in, in the world is prepared for this. And people are building technologies that are putting themselves out of business. But, right? uh, sorry, uh, may I a bit uh, uh, contradict uh, uh, here? Uh, because this debate is uh, here ever since uh, Luddites, uh, or Luddites, whatever they were properly called. So whenever the first industrial machines uh, appeared, so people saying, oh, those industrial machines will take people out of work, it's going to be a catastrophe. So they started to destroy those industrial machines. Uh, if we now think uh, that a couple of centuries ago, they would have prevailed in their thinking, so uh, prohibited steam engine, destroyed all industrial machines, would we be better place uh, in the world now than, uh, than we are currently. So I don't think that uh, uh, everything is doom and gloom and technology is uh, uh, developing and we'll need to adjust it. But whether to say that now... Uh, I don't think it's doom and gloom. gloom. Yeah. I think it's beautiful. I think it's an opportunity for to figure out what do people do that don't have to pack at a computer moving numbers around in a bank account that no one cares about. 
Like, they don't like the job. The job sucks. It's going away. So now you can do other things. What are those things? How do you pay them? How do they make money? Is there universal basic income? I mean, these are big questions. No one's talking about them. In, like, well, I think uh, that's exactly the reason that governments have to step. There has to be a body that brings in the aspects of society. And I think it's not only about jobs. I agree with what the commissioners mentioned. I think if you look through history, every big revolution has taken away some jobs, but at the same time it has created the new ones. But I think this current revolution is really huge because it hits every, every industry. It, it hits not only industry, I mean, it starts from our own private lives, and it ends up on a very high sort of global scale. And it changes our thinking, it changes our perception, it changes our communication. And I think part of that is also that we know more and we kind of are more confused. And uh, the money is there, the opportunities are there, but the currently the gap between up and down is huge, though every single report says that people live better and better, but somehow people down there don't think that they live like Mark Zuckerberg, though they do live better and better if we compare every century. So there's a lot of, like you said, there's a lot of aspects that bring in what, what are people's perception nowadays, because they read things on Twitter, they tweet, they chat, they see all the happy pictures on Instagram. I mean, there's a lot of aspects, and I really think that is a time where we need uh, representative government bodies that are capable to talk together with tech companies, because I do not believe self-regulation, at least not in Silicon Valley, because as you mentioned, the culture is different there, yeah. and that's why I love the European culture, because I think we are more, we are born to think more, <laughs> in a sense, in the, our societies, about what it means for our children, for our other groups in society. So this is, I think this is, incredibly amazing time because we, are, we can be all part of building it. It's not that somebody has brought it and that said, this is how you have to live. No, we actually can make it the way we think. And currently, very dominating part is Silicon Valley. And I think Europe should step up and change that perception because we don't want to live like in China. I'm, I think we can all agree on that. Yeah. So what are the alternatives? And I think Europe is a really good one. So, uh, you know, maybe I can talk to... Um, again, private study that the UK government commissioned. And this was about the impact of artificial intelligence in manufacturing. And interestingly enough, the findings of the report said actually it was a net increase of jobs of about 150,000 plus new jobs in the UK. The issue was around the reskilling. And this is where I think government really can step up. Reskilling the citizens um, to understand this new world of manufacturing, robotic process automation. You know, there still needs to be a human interaction with these smarter technologies. Like that, that just goes without saying. So I think reskilling is very, very important. I think the other thing is the politicians need to educate themselves. I mean, I only have to quote the US senators when they're interviewing Zuck. Absolutely hysterical, right? They didn't understand technology. So I'm calling out to the politicians, um, vice president, <laughs> for example, that educate yourselves in technology so you can ask the right questions and you, your role is to put that kind of social impact and thinking back on the technology companies. And I do believe Europe is very well positioned to do that, very impactfully. Well, that's because it's not a democracy, right? Europe's the bureaucracy or whatever, uh, it's not a democracy. I mean, American democracy is screwed when it comes to this because the politicians can't agree on anything. They can't agree to fund the wall, not fund the wall. If <laughs> they like Trump, not like Trump, it's a mess. But look, here's the reality. We got AI coming, okay? It's basically here right now. There are theories that's gonna turn you into a rat in the maze. Well, guess what, guys? How many people here have Facebook on the phone and use it religiously? You're a rat in a maze, made by Facebook's AI. And uh, hopefully AI won't turn us all into a rat in a maze, but maybe we should tax AI. Um, next, uh, these robots are coming out. Robots are gonna start replacing humans. I didn't see a single coffee shop 
in the Frankfurt airport because every 100 yards there was an espresso machine uh, that you would pay and it would make you a coffee. And then I know companies that made robotic baristas, we need to start thinking about taxing robots. Then what happens when we have this tax income? You know, these billionaires are, I'm not saying, you know, they've done a lot. Uh, and they're, they've done a lot of good for the world in some cases. In other cases, they've done a lot of bad for the world. How do we take the new tax income and distribute it to humanity so that we can flourish and make the world better? Right? These are the questions that government needs to start thinking about because it's coming fast. It's the, and like, it's not something you want to do last minute. So I do think there's an area where Europe's in a great position because Absolutely. it's not a democracy. I agree. And policies can be made from the top down that make a lot of sense by bringing smart people together and recommending it to the member states and saying, hey guys, this is how we should go. It's coming. And then you'd be better prepared and actually might be able to take a leadership position in 10 to 15 years from now when all this hits. Um. Time uh, flies when you're having interesting discussions. I want to, I'm mindful of the fact that people are participating uh, on Slido with questions. So I'm going to take a minute to just look at the screen over there. Um, what are your thoughts? Oh man, this is a contentious topic. The, the famous copyright directive that was just voted. Um, so I, I guess this is a question for you. What are your thoughts on this articles 11 <laughs> and 13 that are very controversial um, on the copyright directive? It's a very specific so, European question. But. Uh, That's what we're here for. Well, we just uh, passed the copyrights directive, so uh, I think it's rather for uh, uh, stakeholders to answer the question, what are their thoughts of the uh, copyrights directive? Because indeed, it's a controversial uh, 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 question that economy is uh, changing and how do we ensure that authors, creators, innovators are getting their share of uh, uh, income or uh, 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 which is generating using their uh, a creation. So that's uh, uh, that's uh, basically the question: Where do you find the right balance? So now uh, this copyright uh, directive uh, has been adopted. So it inches somewhat towards uh, 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 creators. Of course, internet uh, companies uh, are not very excited about this. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it will be always, uh, uh, I would say, something where we'll need to. Uh, find uh, balance. And then maybe to come back to this question of uh, taxation. Well, we're not there with taxing artificial intelligence. First, we need to understand better what it is and how it works before we know how to tax it. But for example, we came... Uh, it will tax you by the time you okay. figure that out. Right. <laughs> Everything is possible. You'll <laughs> uh, be like, but, uh, oh, who am I paying tax to? <laughs> uh, but... Um, uh, uh, but uh, what we had came up already uh, forward with a proposal on taxation of digital economy, because something uh, you notice that uh, uh, so-called digital companies, and it's not limited to GAFAs, it's, it's much broader, uh, are paying uh, around the third of effective tax rate of uh, traditional companies. And with companies uh, increasingly becoming digital, it is eroding the tax base. So at the European Union level, we came with a proposal on how to tax digital uh, companies uh, in a steady state with setting up a concept of virtual permanent establishment because you uh, cannot rely anymore on a tax system which was based on physical presence as it was maybe a century ago. Uh, uh, and uh, some interim solutions. Um, just yesterday, uh, we had some uh, in-depth discussions with uh, OECD, which is working on the same issue internationally. And it also must be said that OECD is making uh, progress. So there seems to be some kind of a, a global consensus emerging on how we uh, could uh, tax uh, uh, digital economy as a first step. Almost out of time, but I'm still going to go to the second question. Oh, we do like to talk about taxes, don't we? Uh, what about tax discount? Actually, I'm going to broaden this question up a little bit. I'm going to go one by one. What do you think local government, European government, what, what do you think policymakers can do to incentivize entrepreneurs to bring foreign talent in to create bigger companies? What's the one thing governments can should do? One by one. Bindi. Um, make immigration easier to bring in some of the great talent, and that harmonization. Eva? 
I agree, we need the talent across the globe come to Europe, and I think we are a very attractive place to be, because uh, it's not a secret, yes, salary is motivating, but the life uh, sort of environment is equally important, and I have heard plenty of people saying that they would love to live in Europe. So I think we have to make it much easier for the talent coming to work, particularly for tech sector, and we have to open up the borders, those obstacles that does not let the magic work scale in Europe. We, are, we have more people than in the US, so there is a market, so we should let that work. Yeah, and then find a way well, to tax happiness. Uh, well, uh, uh, I would say the good uh, starting uh, point would be to stop uh, blocking talent from coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, just to give example, also in uh, Latvia we have, for example, those startup uh, visas, but the conditions could be more startup uh, friendly. So if we want to attract uh, talent, I think uh, first, of, uh, first thing would be to stop preventing uh, talent from coming. There. Every city, every country has slightly different needs and challenges, right, and opportunities. So here's what I would do. I'm not going to give you an answer, I'm going to give you a process. Politicians need to take the entrepreneurs, invite them in, and meet with them and give them a seat at the table and listen to what yeah. they have to say and then act on it. They are. Very, very good answer. Uh, I guess the key word Sometimes. here... Sometimes. I guess the key word here, aside from taxes, is talent. So make this about talent. Thank you so much for the discussion. It was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. No love it. Yes.